Hello and welcome to our weekly Integral Love Relationship Web Jam. My name is Martin Uchik and I'm the author of Integral Relationships, A Manual for Men, and my new book, Sex, Purpose, Love, Couples in Integral Relationships Creating a Better World. Today, we will explore four different methods to identify our transcendental purpose, or what I call our transcendental purpose. And these four methods I discovered when I looked at all the books I could find on purpose and uh, teachings. So some people are teaching and they don't have books. And I realized that they fall into four broad categories, autobiographical, which is also called indirect method by Tim Kelly. And then what I call absent method, with its, which is also called direct method. Then ego transcending methods, these are fall all in all the spiritual uh, categories. And then ego affirming methods. And the whole series of our web gems is to further the integral love relationship vision, which is symbolized in this image here, just to recap. That's couples in integral relationships with a shared purpose that makes the world a better place, who also share intimacy, passion, and commitment. And as we go further into the uh, series, we will dig deeper into what's in the center of that image, that uh, this shared purpose and intimacy, passion, and commitment are shared in what's called all four quadrants along all the seven chakras. And what is really loved is not only our partner, but what is uniquely co-created. And so we will dig in a little deeper today on the shared purpose, specifically how to identify our purpose. And the first thing to become aware of, and we already covered that in uh, one of our previous web gems, is, is that we have a biological purpose and that everybody lives and then some people awaken to living their transcendental purpose. And our biological purpose, as I said, we share with all living beings is to eat, to survive, to reproduce. And then I added a uh, quality of life seeking. And this is uh, important uh, today to keep in mind so we can really separate two forms of quality of life seeking as part of our biological purpose and part of our transcendental purpose. And the word transcendental purpose I use as a collective term for all the various terms that have been used uh, specifically in, in recent history about this additional higher uh, spirits, unique gods, real, true souls, evolutionary, authentic or universe's purpose. These words typically all and these teachings all refer to, to what I call transcendental purpose. And I call it transcendental because it goes beyond our biological purpose. And as we will see, it is sort of like a priori embedded in our DNA before our conscious mind uh, becomes aware of it. The other very important thing about transcendental purpose uh, that I want you to remember uh, is that it always creates more goodness, more truth, more beauty, or more functionality. And this is an and or. And it is always in service of our biological purpose and the well being of others. And in philosophy, we could uh, call that that the expression of our transcendental purpose, the living, the enactment of our transcendental purpose is a eudaimonic form of quality of life seeking based on our true virtuous nature, our daemon, as the old Greeks called that, or maybe we could say our soul or our, our real authentic higher self. Again, referring back to all these names that have been given to, to purpose. And it's also doing what is worth doing and realizing in doing so our full human potential beyond our biological purpose, in addition to our biological purpose, versus the hedonistic form of seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. So quality of life seeking, again, you can have the hedonistic form, seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, 
or it can be can have the eudaimonic form of living our transcendental purpose. And as we covered before, people who live their transcendental purpose typically live seven years longer and enjoy much more fulfilled uh, lives than people who don't. So there is a, also a benefit for ourselves, not only for the world and others, uh, by us living our transcendental purpose after we awaken to it and identified it. And again, briefly recapping is that these four qualities of uh, intelligence, creativity, kindness, empathy, have, and practical skills that we saw here in, in this slide here, that it always creates more goodness, truth, beauty, and functionality, became uh, embedded in our DNA by females selecting men in addition to being good protectors and providers and having stat status and wealth, uh, selected also for intelligence, creativity, kindness, empathy towards their partner and practical skills. And so everybody, you, every human being has a genetic predisposition for cognitive intelligence, creativity, empathy, practical skills, and they're not equally developed. So we may have a strong genetic predisposition as in this uh, graphic here for creativity and maybe not so much cognitive intelligence, medium empathy, and fairly good em uh, practical skills. So everybody has this predisposition, but as we know from genetics, uh, that doesn't mean anything if there is no gene expression, if it's not developed. And so in my book, I use this uh, symbol of a tree to show how at the bottom you see the DNA, how it is encoded in our DNA, empathy in the roots or in the seed. You could say in, in the seed is empathy, kinesthetic abilities, intelligence, and creativity. And then through nurture, specifically in the first three years of our life as our brain and our physical body develops, it's very important that we receive the what's called experience uh, expectant learning and that we receive the right nutrition, that we receive the right impulses from to our senses so that our brain can build the foundation so that we can later uh, develop the skills that are hopefully aligned with our genetic predispositions and then and then in our brain, I'll show another image shortly, uh, myelation will take place of, of certain connections in our brain. And then we can express our purpose, our transcendental purpose, once we awaken to it, or we just naturally express it through creating more beauty, more function, more truth. And there, there's hundreds and thousands of possible expressions that we see basically in, in the top of the tree, how we can express this uh, purpose. And here is quickly another uh, image of, of the a brain cell with uh, its axons that connects it to other brain cells. And so if we learn skills like speaking, riding a bike, riding, driving a car, everything that we can basically do automatically, playing a musical instrument, uh, many, many things that, that, that we think we have. It, it was called muscle memory because people felt that the memory, the ability to perform something was in our muscles. But we, we now know that it just happens. Uh, it, we have this feeling that it happens automatically because the connections between the brain cells that, that uh, control these functions are myelated and fire about 3,000 times faster than brain cells that don't have that myelin sheath. So that's a, a very important part that uh, for the expression of our transcendental purpose that we feel it comes from somewhere deeper in, in, in our soul, our body, or some people feel it comes from outside of them. And so we start out now with, with this sort of like ideal image of, of the tree. And of course, nobody has, you know, the greatest uh, capacity uh, for creating 
uh, beauty, for creating function, for creating truth, for creating goodness. We're, our trees never look uh, uh, that perfect. So I use this a little bit from uh, from my uh, history. So I feel that uh, my my strengths were, or my pre pre uh, conditions, my genetic pre preconditions are having strengths for for empathy and and for morals and activism and exploration. I'm an Enneagram seven, so so I feel I I have good predispositions for goodness. Uh, on the truth side, I'm not very really cognitively intelligent, so I always had problems with math and physics and biology, anything that that requires cognitive intelligence. But I had sort of like always a certain leaning and interest for philosophical questions, which we could put into the truth uh, area. And I also have some some talents for for business. So I built uh, several. Uh, multi-million dollar businesses and I'm still working in this world and I also have some talent for music but my cognitive capacity in my brain was was never fast enough to read music for example so there are certain limitations in my ability to to perform music and so now you can already uh, as you watch this and go back to this tree and 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 think back maybe what what do you think were your original talents and this is what what we want to get to and i grew up in a very supportive and loving uh, family and I was a fourth generation or became a fourth generation electrician so my father had this idea that his firstborn son will step into his footsteps and in my grandfather's and my great grandfather's footsteps and become an electrical engineer, which would require me to, to acquire skills of science and uh, technical skills. And so when my father saw that I was rather playing music and, and, you know, pursuing other things that were not aligned with his vision for who I should become, he somehow, you know, in, in my earlier years, then repressed me developing all these other qualities. And so I, I really trudged through school and, and left school when I was 14 and then started a apprenticeship, an internship as becoming an electrician. And I just totally hated it. I was not good at it. I was a big disappointment for my father. Um, you know, I couldn't really write well. I couldn't spell. It was just like really, I don't want to say horrible, but it, I, I just didn't enjoy my youth at all because I constantly disappointed my, my father because he just didn't see, you know, what my natural talents were and, and supported me in furthering my natural talents. And that went on until I was about 21 when I broke out of, uh, my profession as an electrician and, uh, became for a while a professional musician and then opened a, a music store and, and focused what you see on the left. Then when I was 23, I opened a music store and uh, developed on training on the job and through books and learning by doing, you know, developed my capacities to become a businessman. And I still make a living in, in that area by selling technology. And then on the other side here, I, over the years, then first learning management, uh, acquiring management tools and growing my business and working with people. I always enjoyed that. Then, uh, you know, learned through seminars and workshops and reading books and, and, and practical experience to develop my interest in philosophy and exploration and morals and activism. And here I am at 60, uh, teaching these seminars. <clears throat> Which is probably partly based of, of my own, own experience that over time I, I felt I got really in touch, uh, in, in what my real transcendental purpose is. So this image here then also connects to this image, which I really like is that your, your transcendental purpose in essence is what you love to do. What really fulfills you, what draws you, where time goes by fast, where you're really excited about uh, your what what you're doing, what you do well. That goes back to skills, right? It's not enough that you feel passionate about playing music if you have no skills in singing or playing an instrument or painting or anything, right? You need also the skills uh, to do it well. Ideally, it is something that the world will pay for, 
so that it, that's an indicator for that you provide value and that it's not only for you, but that other people benefit from what you're doing and the moral component, what the world needs. And all these four dimensions, if you're integrally informed, of course, uh, connect to the, uh, to the four quadrants. And now we're getting actually to our topic, uh, to the four discovery methods, again, autobiographical, absent, ego transcending, ego affirming. And, uh, oh, yeah. So one thing that is interesting, what I learned in from the book from Tim Kelly, uh, which is called True Purpose. It's a kind of small book, but uh, very profound, I thought, and also other uh, purpose guides mentioned that, that a lot of people uh, have sort of like an, uh, a fear or, or psychological blocks to even go to this uh, uh, wanting to find out what their transcendental purpose is. And I think there is uh, two reasons for that. One of them is that it is quite, can be quite painful when we realize at one point that we, we weren't really living our purpose. And you know, let's say you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, and, and, and all of a sudden you realize you weren't really living what you were meant to do, what's in your DNA. And you were just, for whatever reasons, uh, focusing on living your biological purpose, which is, of course, important. And, and I'm totally in support of that. And maybe you lived the dream of someone else or you just fell into a profession or did something. I have a friend, he's a, works for the I, INS. Um, and no, not for the INS, for the Internal Revenue Service, IRS. And when I talked to him about it, he said, oh, I always had a passion for language. And I realize now that I should have probably done something with language, but somehow my father and, and circumstances, you know, that presented itself. And, and, and so I did this and, and, you know, he's not very happy in his job, for example, but it's kind of too late now to change careers. And, and so that, that can, of course, create a lot of, uh, uh, sad feelings. And the other thing is that, uh, you know, change, in some ways can be good, but change can also be dangerous. And so we have this immune system to change. And just as our biological immune system, you know, protects our body from, from illness and, and, um, and also from doing crazy things in a way, our psychological immune system, it can, can also become a hindrance. It can turn against us. And so these purpose guides all say that first they usually have to deal with all the blocks that that prevent people from uh pursuing their uh, uh finding out what their transcendental purpose is and then living it and the best way to do that i found is uh from a book from robert keegan called immunity to change and they have these these four tiered system where on the left side you would first write down your goal so in this case let's say live your transcendental purpose. And then uh, in order to reach that goal, you could write down and say, work with a purpose guide, get a new degree, save money for starting your own business, find a life partner who shares your purpose. So that would be on the left com column, but then uh, Keegan and Laney, his uh, partner, I mean, his, his writing partner, research partner, they found out that a lot of people are doing other things instead. So we could say, well, instead of pursuing our living our transcendental purpose, we pursue some hedonistic uh, activities, which, for example, could be going out to have fun with friends, staying in a dysfunctional love relationship instead of talking with our partner and, and seeing how we both can uh live our transcendental purpose or finding a partner who wants to live it with us and working in an unfulfilling, unfulfilling uh, but safe job, right? So we would do that instead of pursuing what's in the left column. And then they found out that there is some hidden competing commitments that are preventing us from pursuing our goals. So this could be, for example, I'm committed to being loyal, having fun and, uh, staying safe, I'm afraid to be alone and broke, things like that. So there's there is something that competes with our our goal. 
And then, you know, there is sort of like what, what we tell ourselves, why we cannot pursue our goal. My friends depend on me and I need to balance work with my play and leisure time. I made a commitment to my partner. I don't want to rattle the relationship. I don't want to, you know, speak up. Uh, I promised my colleagues at work I would not quit. I feel that I'm really needed there and the company, you know, depends on me. Uh, Maybe we have to pay back student loans or something. And I mean, these are all valid things. So I'm not saying, you know, radically change your life, but these are often hindrances that, that we would even start to, to pursue living, identifying and living our transcendental purpose. And so there are big assumptions that, that we're making around these hidden commitments, like seeking pleasure, avoiding risks and being loyal is the path to happiness could be an assumption and not taking the risk to, to live uh, our purpose. I have this sentence, it's better to fail at living our own life than succeeding at living someone else's. And so it's always this balance, right? Where, you know, we don't want to be too selfish in pursuing our own life. That why I, that's why I say our transcendental purpose is always in support of the well-being of others and of our biological purpose and creates more goodness, truth, beauty and functionality. So what we can do, or, or the, going back to the assumptions, if I neglect my old friends, they will no longer like and support me and I will not have any fun. If I would lose my partner, I could not bear the pain and won't find somebody else. Or if I quit at work, nobody else can do my job or I will go broke, right? So, so these are the assumptions. And then the question is, of course, you know, how do we overcome and, and, uh, Keegan and Le Lehaney, I think is her name. They, uh, first, of course, uh, suggest that you take your emotions into account, not only think that rationally through, but really live, uh, listen to your unconscious, listen to your emotions and then test your big assumptions and see if they're really true and see what presented the most significant obstacles in your life to live your transcendental purpose. And then you can start to think of low risk scenarios to take the first steps towards your goals. And a related process is what's called voice, a voice dialogue, which was developed by Hal and Citra Stone and then later picked up by Dennis Genpo Mercel, Mercel in his uh, Big Mind process that some of you may be familiar with. There is a book and then Tim Kelly in his book, True Purpose is also using voice dialogue. And the idea behind it is that there are about 15 to 20, so like inner voices. Some of them, they call the protector, the controller, the risk manager, the critic, the judge, the skeptic, the doubter, the cynic, the victim, the image consultant, and so on and so forth. And these voices basically try to protect us from harm. And they're obviously the ego, our false sense of self. And they speak from the, from past pain and fear of the future. And when we start to talk with these voices, listen to these voices and then engage in a dialogue with them in the present moment, you know, you speak most likely from more of an authentic, real present uh, self. And so these dialogues, and I don't go totally into it, but they go something like that. So you say, I would like to talk to my inner voice that is most present right now, pre preventing you from moving forward with identifying your transcendental purpose. So that could be the protector or the controller or the risk manager or whatever, right? And then the voice would say, well, what do you want, right? And I say, what is your role? And you say, well, I'm protecting you from taking any risks or feeling hurt or sad or frustrated about, you know, identifying your transcendental purpose. And then you say, well, I would like to find my purpose. What are your concerns, fears, objections? And then this voice will talk back and say, well, my concerns are, and then you can refer back a little bit to this list here, right? Where, where we have, uh, your, your emotions basically voicing all these concerns and objections. Um, and then you can say to your voice, well, why do you think that? And the voice will talk back because da, 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 da. And then this will lead you to say, well, I hear your concern. And you come up with, with certain scenarios where we say, well, well, what about that, right? If I take a baby step, if I uh, 
would have an exit plan and say, okay, we try this until this and this happens, and then I would abort. Would that be agreeable with you? And so you you repeat this process with all these inner voices until you feel really ready and open to identify your transcendental purpose. So that's the prerequisite to, in a way, all these other to these four uh, discovery methods. So now we gonna look at our at the first method which is called the autobiographical method and that's as i said is also called an indirect access method because we're not going with this method at at the root of the tree but we look at what made us happy what worked well for us in uh, our past life you know where were we thriving felt in line with our with our purpose and that works well for people who already had a multitude of life experience who try different things that they can then look back at and um, and you know it's been with the natural ups and downs so they they know what works and what doesn't so they were not stuck just in one path and who already developed some skills that are aligned with their natural talents and you know, there are some people who just naturally live their transcendent purple, transcendental purpose pretty much all their life. So they don't even need to do any of these processes. And so, and this is that what comes closest to that. So you already kind of like did things and, and you just then empath, empathize more on, on what already worked and, and do less of or avoid doing what, what didn't work in, in, in your life so far. So that's relatively easy and uh, described in, in Tim Kelly's book, True Purpose, at, at the beginning. So again, coming back to our tree, you could just say, you know, was I was thriving when I was creating beauty in some form or when I was creating some function for in some form or some truth or some goodness. And uh, it was in service of others, so I got appreciated uh, with it. I love to do it. it. It fits these four circles that I showed earlier. And then you you follow more of that path and ideally then share it with someone who shares your transcendental purpose. So here again, we see what activities and experience made you feel happy, joyful, fulfilled, successful, and in the flow of life over an extended period of time versus those activities that didn't. And very often this is called follow your bliss and what made you feel alive. And there is also a danger in, in this kind of following your bliss and what you made you feel alive because it can be that it was a uh, part of your biological purpose of quality of life seeking. And if you take a closer look, it was rather hedonistic. Um, I really enjoyed uh, watching uh, Breaking Bad. And in, I think in the last episode, Walter White again wants to explain to his wife why why he did all these things. And she says, you know, I, I no longer want to hear that you did it for the family. Then he says, well, no, I didn't make it for the family. I did it because it made me feel alive. And obviously what he did was very despicable and certainly not in you know, creating more good truth, beauty and, and function in the world and was not in service of others. So it was very selfish in a way, but it made him feel alive. And so we, we may feel that doing what makes us feel alive uh, is our purpose um, but it very often is not. So a lot of people can justify their actions by saying, well, it made me feel alive and it's my purpose. And, and I have like a really, really big problem with that. If purpose uh, guides or, or instructions how to get in touch with our purpose don't have these, these moral uh, guidelines uh, implemented in them. And so here is two books, which I already mentioned, Tim Kelly, True Purpose, and also uh, Tom Rath wrote this uh, book, Strength Finders, uh, based on the research of Don Clifton. So these are good books to, uh, for, your, for um, identifying your purpose through autobiographical, through the autobiographical method. The next comes the absent uh, methods, and they're called uh, direct access methods because they attempt to go directly to the root of your tree and they work well for people 
who never felt a strong sense of purpose beyond their biological purpose and are open to a psycho-spiritual method. So that's much more challenging. And as I just said, this, these methods basically go back to basically before you could really think about what brought you joy in your life uh, and uses the unconscious to go uh, to the root of your being. And that's why they often call that the soul, you know, getting in touch with your soul, this, this process. So the soul's purpose or yes, soul's purpose. And so these methods usually use uh, state experiences. So they can be vision quests or hypnotherapy or some deep introspection, um, quieting your mind, uh, doing psychotherapies. I'm not really an expert and I will probably have uh, Jonathan Gustin, who, who is really a, a great expert on, on the process of that in the, uh, in, on our web jam in the future. But so, so the way I see that is that you feel back as far as possible to your roots and maybe you get in touch with things that what activities that you feel really drawn to as a child or also what you, other people that you felt drawn to who, who represented basically your, your purpose. So maybe you had some role models and you thought, I want to be like them, but then life circumstances or your whole nature, uh, your whole nurturing and your skill development just didn't go into the direction of these people, right? Or maybe you read certain books. So these are all pointers to, to, to your purpose that was present before you, you got uh, nurtured and developed skills. And then you can go back and, and, and see what were you able to express, you know, and develop and what not. And contrary to the autobiographical methods who are sort of like following your bliss and what makes you feel alive, the absent method usually follows what pains you the most. Where, where do you feel something in the world is missing, right? More justice, more beauty more more truth or more function right and, and you just feel drawn to what's called what Bhaskar calls absent these absences right or cure these ills in a way so you you, you feel this constant drawing that something is not right and, and you feel called to to make it right or more beautiful or more functional um, or more good in a way and Part of the absent methods are also then, you know, developing a vision and what we want to contribute for creating a better world. And I found uh, three books that are um, applying this, uh, this method through purpose from Tim Kelly again in his second part, The Soul's Code by James Hillman. And there is a fairly unknown book and Curtis Anthony just wrote me this morning that he would be on, 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 on the web gem in the future. Uh, his book is called Where, What Were You Born to Do? So they all give you instruction and, and the, the, this, uh, What Were You Born to Do is actually a workbook. And then uh, Jonathan Gustin, he has the Purpose Guides uh, Institute. So you, uh, if you have something to write, might want to write down that um, web address, purposeguides.org. And then if you look uh, Google Purpose Octagon, this is a, like his eight-step process that goes from, from number one, developing a, a vision for the end result, what you want to uh, achieve by embodying your purpose, creating values around your ideals, then get in touch with your core powers. And again, here we see this, the natural soul level abilities that you were born with. So that goes back to the roots of the tree, your essence, the core of who you are without doing anything. So that's this uh, um, doing without doing, just coming from, from an authentic, you know, unmediated place, basically what got myelated in, in your brain. Number five, what you actually offer to people to transform them. So that's for, for the purpose guides. A mission calling or seed assignment that you undertake to support your vision, your message. So, so there it's also important that you, in, in his teaching, not only that, that you know what your purpose is, but also that you enact it. 
So a single fundamental truth you are designed to propagate. In my case, that's the integral relationship vision and your delivery system. So I'm using this webinar software right now, for example, uh, to deliver my message and my book and, and my workshops and so on and so forth. So Jonathan will most likely also be a guest on one of the future shows. And I think he, from what I know, I think he's the best uh, purpose guide right now in probably in the world because he draws from a lot of other sources that you will see uh, next. So next are the ego transcending methods. And they work well for people who sense that there is a higher power, a God or a higher intelligence, a higher spirit, or that there is an inherent purpose in evolution, right? That, 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 um, that our drive to create more goodness, truth, beauty, or function is actually not so that they believe these people that they're not uh, embedded in our DNA because of the sexual selection process, but that, that it comes from somewhere outside of us. And that we can align ourselves with this higher gods, whatever spirits, universes, evolutionaries purpose by transcending our ego. And, and with ego there, uh, people mean our false or separate sense of self. And that would mean in, in our tree example that you're getting rid basically of the whole top part of the tree, right? Any kind of thinking, feeling, getting in touch with, with anything, you know, you, you transcend. And then when you're in, in your pure witness consciousness, so to speak, then naturally your, your, what your transcendental purpose or your God's purpose or whatever we want to call it, then would naturally in the moment emerge through you. So they basically say, who are you if you are not your body, not your thoughts, not your feelings, not your experience, right? What is left when, when you go, you know, in, on the, in the spiritual levels of, uh, the gross, the subtle, or when you transcend the gross, the subtle, the causal, and then even, you know, the pure witness, who, what is left? And then what is alive in you then in the moment without pain of the past or fear of the future? You know, what wants to emerge to you? And that goes actually back to a, a line in the Tao Te Ching where Lao Tzu wrote, or, and now, of course, it got translated. Do you have the patience to wait till your mud settles and the water is clear? Can you remain unmoving till the right action arises by itself? So that's basically the ego transcending method. And we, can, we, we there's no way for us to know what will then emerge. But the assumption is that it either you know, in, in a modern way, in my way to say it would really emerge from, from your DNA, from your original seed, from your original potential, or most other people that I will show you in a second, you know, would say that you align yourself with, with something outside of yourself, you know, some higher power. And naturally there is a lot of books, you know, that, uh, propagate this kind of idea. And they also speak to people at different levels of consciousness. So I really enjoyed actually reading Rick Warren's book, What on Earth Are uh, Am I Here to, For? And up there it says it, it sold over 40 millions. And I was really curious, uh, you know, and also interestingly, he shows he has that tree image. I, I never noticed that actually just in this moment, see that he also uses the tree image. Maybe I unconsciously picked it up from him. Um, and what he essentially says is that, that our purpose is to live God's purpose, God's worth, word, and, and adhere to the Bible and maybe also to Rick Warren's ideas of what our purpose is. So I, I found some really good, interesting pearls of wisdom in there, which I would say are really helpful from people who, who move from an egocentric state to a mythic state or are, you know, religious believers. So that this is not a bad book in itself. Um, then a great book, Otto Schammer and, and his writing partner, Katrin Kaufer, leading from the emerging future. So that's this, uh, theory U process that we cannot go into in detail, but in my book, Sex, Purpose, Love, I, I have a, a summary of it. And, uh, you probably, I don't know if you can see it, but it, it says here from ecosystem to 
ecosystem economics. So this is very much uh, based on, on economics, this book. But again, you know, moving from ego to echo, to economics. Then a, another great book, Nature and the Human Soul uh, by Bill Blatkin. And it, it's not on the cover, but in the book, he says, you know, moving from egocentric to ecocentric. So, so he's more into ecology and, and thinks, you know, our, our ego basically removed us from our true nature. Again, what I would say removed us from, from what is in our DNA to express our DNA and to that our higher transcendental purpose is to uh, serve our biological purpose and the well-being of others. So I love this book. Um, you may know that I studied with Eckhart Tolle for five years, six years, and A New Earth, which came after The Power Now, is awakening to your life's purpose. Unfortunately, Eckhart doesn't differentiate between biological and transcendental purpose. Uh, just the basic message is like, if we all transcend our ego, then we will naturally create a better world. Uh, in essence, not a bad idea, but in my opinion, very limited and can lead to a lot of new age narcissism, spiritual bypassing, uh, and yeah, actually dysfunction. Andrew Cohen took that idea a step further with evolutionary enlightenment that, that he really saw that it's not only being present in the now, but also that, that our being is part of the evolutionary uh, process so that we're not just a witness of what's going on around us, but we're really an, an active part. And, and Andrew's book really and, uh, inspired me to become an integral love relationship evolutionary, if you want, I no longer like to use that word. Uh, but that was a big inspiration for me. But again, my criticism, there is nothing, no, no checks and balances in there for that our purpose really needs to create more goodness, truth, beauty, and function, and needs to be in uh, support and service of our biological purpose and the well-being of others, and that we cannot separate uh, biological evolution from the evolution of consciousness and cultural evolution. And then another work that I studied quite a few years ago is The Diamond Approach by A. H. Almas. Again, I mentioned all these different books and, and their essence in, in my book, Sex, Purpose, Love. And this is a, like a psycho-spiritual approach to what, what the diamond they see, again, as our, I don't know what they call it, as our authentic, real, you know, unconditioned self, so to speak. And then out of that, um, you know, our transcendental purpose can can emerge. And then finally, the first, uh, the last one is ego affirming messages. And they work well for people who already have a clear sense what their gifts to the world are, what their transcendental purpose is, but they are afraid of their own power and therefore hold back to shine their light and live large. So I'm, I'm using the words a little bit of the people who are proponents of ego affirming methods and people who are proponents of uh, ego affirming message uh, uh, methods, they basically assume that however your tree in the top part looks is already perfect. And there's so like, how could it be otherwise? And of course I have 10, I mean, there, there is potentially a problem with that if you're kind of like delusional and you, you know, you have so like some grandiose ideas, but have not developed the skills or you develop skills that are not really aligned with with your root, you know, your your real uh, potentials that are in in your DNA. But on the other side, you know, they can be very powerful if people hold back and are afraid of of shining their light in the world. So, so the questions are: What are your limiting beliefs about yourself and how God or the universe wants to work through you? What are you afraid of to fully shine your light into the world? Who are you not to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous? So I go with all of that, with that grain of salt in a way that it really needs to be aligned with, with our precondition, with our genetic precondition, and that we need to develop the skills to really provide a value. 
and proponents of uh, these kind of methods are interestingly now to to women, you know, everything else before were men. And that's Marian Williamson, who wrote many books. So I just put out the law of divine compensation, you know, and again, here we see on work, money and, and miracles. So there is often a high level of magical thinking in, involved. And then uh, Jean Houston, who also wrote multiple books, I just couldn't find one that 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 really talks about purpose, but she now teaches a class, uh, Awakening to Your Life's Purpose with uh, Jean Houston, which you can Google and find. And uh, their core message, Marian Williamson's and uh, Jean Houston's message are also in my book. And so once we, we know what our transcendental purpose is, you know, now we connect to a, to a previous webinar that you can look up on, on my YouTube channel, then we can share our transcendental purpose in the uh, public sphere on the right and the domestic sphere in on the left by co-creating more truth, goodness, beauty, and function through dialogue that takes into account care, compassion, relationships, rights, justice, autonomy, and uh, yeah. So that's basically my uh, invitation uh, or my, my presentation. And I want to invite you to uh, share some comments. Uh, and I'm also going to put up a, a quick survey that you can say, do you know what your transcendental purpose is? So maybe please click on, on the yes, the no, or you're not sure. So I'm just going to give that a, that a second. And if you want to come online, then you can click on that that hand, and maybe you want to share what what your purpose is and how you awoke into it, and and how you uh, maybe share it even with a partner if you want to share it with a partner. So now it changed a little bit, so we have <laughs> some people are going back and forth. So I'm closing this poll now. So we have sixty percent yes, uh, zero no. Let's see, and forty not sure. And let's see. And I created another purpose, uh, another poll. So, which of these methods do you think resonated most with you? The autobiographical, you know, just looking back, what made you feel alive uh, in 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 your past life? The absent method, using sort of like the the deep going into your unconscious, going back to the root, the spiritual approach of ego transcendence, most famous through Eckhart Tolle and other spiritual teachers, going back to Lao Tzu, can you be still long enough for the mud to settle until the water becomes clear? Ego affirming that you're already perfect the way you are, you just no longer hold back and just shine your light into the world, or a combination or none of the above. So it seems like a combination. And I, I think that's actually a very good way. That's why I uh, included all these four methods in, in the book. And again, as I said, it also depends on your, your life history and where you are right now. So we have 75% a combination and 25% autobiographical. Somebody else voted, so we now have 80% a combination. Well, thank you. I'm ending this poll. So nobody mentioned absent and ego transcendence and ego affirming. So now we're at 83% uh, a combination. So that, that seems to make most sense to me. Let's see, I'm just gonna check if I... Yep, 
these were my two polls. So Danny writes uh, from calling in from Santa Rosa, immunity to change and wise dialogue seem like very powerful mindfulness techniques to keep change, growth, development, evolution flowing. Yes, absolutely. So um, we probably can all, f and, and, and I have that fear all the time in these voices, right? If I if I focus too much on, on, on ideals, you know, will I neglect what sustains my life, what, uh, my income? And, uh, and also, will I be judged? Will I be rejected? You know, or am I just completely out of my mind in, or arrogant? You know, somebody called me a, an arrogant, pompous ass for, uh, putting out this message, you know, and, and, and furthering the integral relationship vision. So, you, you know, if, the more you show up, you know, there's this, uh, these, uh, 12 or 10 paradoxical commandments. You know, if, if we uh, try to do good in the world, people will reject us. And if we try to help people, they will punish us and punish us and so forth. Um, I don't have that up right now, but uh, it just comes to mind in the moment. So you can, uh, look that up online. And then Dan also says, I perceive that a combination is equivalent to the integral approach. Yes, that is absolutely true because it, uh, I think it probably also aligns somewhat with these four circles that I was showing earlier of doing what we love to do, what we do well, what the world needs and what the world pays for. So, does anyone uh, want to share about their experience of living their purpose, awakening to their purpose, pursuing their purpose? Then please click on, on that hand to make that speak request. Um, I'm just going to pay attention over here. Or you want to type in some, some question or comment? And if not, then I'm just going to go back to our slide presentation. So I said, as I said in, in a previous gem, and as we reiterated uh, here today, is that we all have different capacities for intelligence, creativity, empathy, and practical skills. And then, of course, they get developed as we, we grow up and, and develop uh, capacities in one or more of these areas. And as I, as I showed you earlier, you know, there is usually a combination that we can combine two in order or three in order then to focus them on, on enacting or living our purpose. But nobody has strengths, full capacities or maximum capacities in all these four areas. And one reason why I'm so excited about this idea of sharing our transcendental purpose in a, in a, in a love relationship is that, let's say in my case, right, living, uh, promoting the integral uh, love relationship vision, I, I feel I have fairly good skills around empathy. And the moral aspect aspects of that, you know, really feeling pain around all um, the lack of love in the world, and and that humans don't don't uh, get along with each other, you know, all the all the conflicts, and uh, it's it's just really really painful for me. Uh, and so I'm 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 coming kind of like from my pain around that, and I also have fairly good practical management organizational skills, and. Uh, I'm often not the most creative person and I have a certain lack of I have a, a learning disability. So I, I cannot retain a lot of uh, information and uh, I'm a slow reader and things like that. So for me, an ideal partner, uh, she would have strengths in the areas of creativity and cognitive intelligence and maybe, you know, not so many strengths in, in, in practical skills, we probably would want to have similar concerns about the world and, and empathy. And then if we would combine our strengths, then, you know, we would have maximum or, or close to maximum 
uh, strengths in all these four areas. And if you want to enact or achieve anything positive uh, in the world, let's say further the integral love relationship vision, of course, it's best and most effectively done when it is done with intelligence, with creativity, with empathy, and, uh, you know, in a practical uh, way, the delivery methods, as Jonathan Gustin calls it. So that's, that's the underlying uh, idea. Uh, Dan asks if he can come online if he doesn't have a camera. Well, you cannot, unfortunately, you need a camera and a, and a, and a microphone. Um, and the other reason why, why I'm so excited about this idea of shared transcendental purpose is because we cannot be feminine and masculine simultaneously, which is symbolized here by, by this image from my first book and then in my second book. And of course, that comes from Ken Wilber, that the masculine is ascending and agentic, and the feminine is descending and communal. And people who are at an integral level or higher, they usually can embody equally feminine and masculine polarity. So they, they can be agentic or communal. So they have choice. And there is healthy expressions of each of these four polarities. So integral people constantly work on developing ever healthier capacities for agency, communion, ascending, creating bigger systems, looking at a bigger picture and descending, being touch with the body, with the earth, with feeling, and so and so forth. But we cannot do both simultaneously. So a simple example is when I facilitate a workshop, I notice clearly how I can either have the attention, my focus on the whole room and on the whole group, or I can then interact with one person specifically and really feel into what's going on with them and, and dialogue with them and have my full attention on them. Uh, but it's basically impossible for me to do both simultaneously. And so when I, when I have my attention on the whole room, I always feel I'm not as much as I would like to be on individual participants. And when I work with an individual participant, specifically if I'm engaged in, in an exercise myself, then I cannot have my focus on the whole room. And so when I co-facilitate with someone who understands these dynamic, that dynamics, then we can naturally shift, you know, between, between the two. So if, if one of us is on the individual, the other one can, can be on the group and vice versa. Or another reason is, is that, you know, manifesting our transcendental purpose, living our transcendental purpose always involves a, like a, a part of where, where we just have to take care of the business side, so to speak. And then one is really delivering our message or, or doing the workshops. And very often I feel sort of like, and, and I learned this from Brian Wetton, a lot of helping professionals feel caught between you know, delivering their service, doing what they really love to do and, and do well and feel passionate about and focusing around uh, creating the infrastructure, doing, you know, doing what the world pays for, creating, doing all these works. And so sometimes helping professionals, uh, they look for a partner who is fairly good in, in, in helping them deliver their message so that they can focus on delivering the message. But this is, of course, very unequal. And so that's another reason why why I awoke to this uh, to this idea and this deep desire to share my my passion and my purpose with a partner, so that we could take turns in doing that. Because then I very often and others do that too fall into not doing either. So you're not really promoting your business because you feel you should more deliver your message, and when you deliver your message, you feel somewhat oh I should also focus on on promoting the business. So. These are two reasons that that had a, a big influence on me uh, and which then ultimately led me, of course, to write uh, my book, Sex, Purpose, Love, where this is all outlined in, in great detail. So thank you, everyone, for joining us and for participating. So have a great weekend, and I hope to see you again next Saturday.